money and profit, it has become completely distorted and completely rapacious. So I guess I guess the important thing from a, a business person's point of view is being aware of that and looking to see what can be done in a collaborative way amongst the people who operate on their scale and on their, if you like, philosophy. Hello, I'm your host, Evelyn Clark, and this is the Six Star Business Podcast, where we have conversations with amazing, incredible people all about what it takes to be Six Star, going beyond the status quo, doing things differently, and how they bring purpose, love, and impact into their businesses every day. You know, as small business owners or business owners in general, entrepreneur, whatever we want to call ourselves, I feel like we have not only a responsibility, but we have the opportunity to create change. We can create change on a very high, fast impact level in our communities, in our families, and our around us in the world, industries, everything, far more than other people, far more than the big, big corporates. And we all know that our world is in a, in a pretty hectic, crazy space. There's so many things impacting us at the moment. And my guest in this week's podcast, Derek Dearden, has lived many decades. He's seen a lot. He knows a lot more than most. And he's got this wonderful scientific engineering brain and he's got a heart and he cares about humanity. He shares a message of hope and ties in what small business owners can do to help create a positive future. He's written a very interesting book. It's on Amazon. And he talks about, I guess, the the challenges that we face today, but also the opportunities we have. And as small business owners, I feel like we need to take heed. I invite you to enjoy, sit back and really listen to this one with the beautiful Derek Dearden. Ah, so good to be here. Thank you so much, Derek. It is a pleasure to have you and welcome to Six Star Business Podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And thank you for having me on the call. Pleasure You're welcome. For me to be here. <laughs> <laughs> pleasure is mine. You know, when I first got introduced to you, like through our mutual friend Rob, and he told me about you, I was so excited, and I said, "Yes, please, I'd love to meet him." And meeting you was an absolute pleasure, and having you on the call is even more of a pleasure. And I'm so excited to hear from you and be able to share all of your genius and knowledge with our listeners today. So. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Well, let's get started. You know, I like to ask my guests uh, some really hard questions up front. Uh, And the hardest one of all, which is, can you tell us where you are in the world? Right. Okay. So uh, I'm in the south of England. Uh, I live in uh, a cottage uh, in a national park called the New Forest. Um, It's been called the New Forest for a thousand years. It was William the Conqueror's hunting ground. And we've got ancient oak and beech woodlands outside, and there are ponies and cows and pigs and sheep wandering around uh, without any fences. Uh, and and they all belong to people. The deer don't, but all the other animals belong to people, and they usually go home to their farm at night. No fences. N- no fences. Like before before the landowners decided to fence it off, this was one of the bits that got left out. <laughs> wow. I-, I wonder, like all the listeners listening to that, they're probably like trying to compute. What does it what does it look like? What how would how would that be? Okay, look it up, folks. Um the <laughs> the new farm in the south of England. New, n- the, the new for- new forest. New, sorry, the new forest in the south yeah. of England. And, yeah. and check it out. It sounds so idyllic and interesting and beautiful. Yeah. It would be very hard to live anywhere else now. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me. I know it's uh, early in the morning for you and it's late afternoon for me. And uh, thanks to technology, we get to, we get to connect. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's a good thing. Tell me, Derek, the next question I like to ask my guests is uh, who do you serve and how do you serve them? Okay, well, I guess there's two answers. I mean, what I want to talk about mostly on this call is, is if you like, my 
my life project now. Um, and uh, I'll give you a bit of background for the um, I, I had about five jobs over the first three years after I left university <laughs> and uh, then concluded I didn't want another job. I wanted to uh, work for myself. And, and there was very little in the way of education of any kind then. And, and of course, now we're much more fortunate, but we're also a bit less fortunate in, in a lot of the information that purports to tell people how to run businesses um, is, is actually counterproductive. But anyway, uh, through the school of a uh, bit of background, I taught myself electronics when I was a teenager, building radio sets and stereo systems and things. Um, I went to university. Uh, rather than reading electrical engineering, which would have been the logical thing to do, I, I, I was actually reading natural sciences. I read physics, chemistry and maths initially at Cambridge. Uh, for various reasons, I changed to philosophy, and that's what I got my degree in. I came out, I got a job um, developing computer systems, and uh, that was what I mostly did in the periods of employment. I worked on, actually, some quite high-powered projects, but not for very long. Um, and uh, and so when I set up working for myself, I initially started um uh, building electronic equipment for people. I, I built hi-fi systems. I built uh, uh, amplification systems for musicians and things like that. Uh, and then uh, one way or another, the digital electronics came along and then the microprocessor came along. And I was one of the very few people with backgrounds in both hardware design and computer software. And for most of my life, I was doing something in one form or another of that crossover. I, I designed equipment for rock bands in the 70s. Uh, I worked mainly with Yes, uh, had a base in their warehouse. I also built stuff for Queen, various other bands, Gentle Giant, ACDC, and um, uh, Pink Floyd bought some of my equipment, although I didn't deal with them directly. And uh, I, I built some custom equipment uh, for Brian May, the guitarist in Queen. Uh, that was all a lot of fun. Um, I've done all kinds of other things. I, I developed one of the first point of sale systems that was available to small retailers using a desktop computer and uh, additional functionality that I could put into a cheap till rather than them needing the enormous expensive point of sale systems that the big stores of the world had. Uh, I put in systems on toll bridges. So I, I served people essentially by being at the cutting edge of technology for most of my career. Uh, then from 1980 onwards, a lot of my skills became kind of commoditized. There were people coming in already being trained up. There was a lot of stuff. We didn't have to build the stuff from the ground up. There were, there were a lot of stuff already available in the way of software, in the way of um, ready-built modules and so forth. I've done quite a lot in terms of uh, coaching and mentoring people in business uh, based on the experiences I've had. But uh, what I've been doing for the past two or three years is it, I've been trying to further the conversation about the kind of world that we want to live in, the kind of world that we want our children and grandchildren to live in. And uh, it's plain to me that we really are at a critical time in human history. I mean, I, I believe there have been some big inflection points. Um, obviously, uh, one of them was when humanity settled down and started farming the land and domesticating animals about 12,000 years ago. Uh, another one was about 6,000 years ago when societies became a lot more organized, when the alpha male somewhere decided to set up a, a city state and have a palace and a temple 
and uh, extend the range of their, their um, serfs or, or whatever they were called. And uh, another one was when we had the Industrial Revolution, uh, microelectronics and cybernetics over the past 70 years is obviously some kind of transition. But now we're reaching the point where multiple things are coming together. A lot of people are aware of what they call crises or problems in the world. And uh, there's a lot of despair about that. There's a lot of resignation. And the conversation that I'm having and leading is that, yes, it is possible that the the, the, the epoch that we're living through is plainly coming to an end. The, the epoch of cheap, easily, high power availability of energy from fossil fuels is coming to an end. Uh, it, it, some people are denying that, but it, it, it's obvious it is. And I, th I would say that the 6,000 year cycle that I call the era of domination is also coming to an end. So the question is, what's, what's next? And we can all think about the gloomy, scenarios of what's next and uh, i don't need to dwell on that there's plenty of information people can have but what i'm saying the conversation that i'm leading is that, that it is also possible that humanity lives in harmony with itself in harmony with the earth in harmony with the cosmos and within the flow of energy that is coming from the sun and radiating on out into space and with the materials that we have we could have a life of universal prosperity peace opportunity and fulfillment and i describe that i d describe it uh in this extremely slim book that i I've written and self-published called The Letter from 2100, because by 2100, the, the chips are going to have settled down. In fact, by the end of the century, uh, by the end of this decade, uh, it's going to be, I think, obvious which fork of the road we're going down. And um, I've, I've got a website called One World That Works. The idea is, principally, my idea is that if enough people have share that vision and align their own lives with that vision, it will happen. And if not enough do, it won't. And I don't overrate my chance to make much of a dent in it, but I want to throw in my five pence worth with whatever I've got left in terms of years on this planet. And there are a million other people also with positive messages and the, and um, so that's that's what I'm serving. Wow, you know, Derek, there is so much in what you just said, and uh, I'm sure that you know our listeners are kind of like in a completely bit of a bit of a head spin because you started off with the cutting edge of technology and creating these systems and tools for music artists and shops and different, you know, um, industries. And then you just went straight to, well, look at the state of the world. And I, I'm here as a thought leader to talk about how we can save the world. Really? Oh my God. Okay. So before we start unpacking this, <laughs> what do you do in your spare time when you're not busy trying to save the world and, uh, play with new electronics? Well, uh, I, I, I've got a, a, a family. I've got a, a, a beautiful wife. We've been married 45 years. Uh, just a week ago, uh, she had a hip replacement hospital, uh, operation. I collected her from the hospital two days later. And, uh, right now, <laughs> uh, I, I'm supporting her. She's going from strength to strength. She wanders up and down the garden already. And, uh, uh, it's, uh, Getting by on one crutch rather than two as much as she can. Uh, we've, we've got a wonderful garden here. Uh, mo most of the most beautiful aspects, we've got two ponds full of water lilies. Uh, we've got massive roses that are all coming out now. Uh, the creative side of it, she does. And, uh, I, I, I mow the lawn and pull up the singing nettles. 
Um, <laughs> so there's that. Uh, I cycle still. I've, I've been doing that since I was a teenager, and of course, it's it's wonderful to have an environment like this round here uh, to cycle without too much worry about getting flattened by cars and lorries and <laughs> smothered in smoke. Um, for a, a good part of the um, uh, I guess the last forty years, I, yeah, um, forty years. Uh, I, I was a competitive highboard diver and a coach and a trampolining coach. And uh, I, I did my last competition 10 years ago. We have things called master's competitions uh, where you compete against people in your own age bands. I actually only took it up when I was 36. And uh, I, I entered the county championship about nine months later and it predictably came last. There were a lot of people going, what's that whole fool thing he's doing? <laughs> Four years later, I won it. <laughs> um, and uh, that was diving against people like half my age who'd been training for five or six years. Um, but I've mostly done masters competitions. I've been, I was a European masters champion. Um, I've been a British masters champion uh, at least half a dozen times the last time, 11 years ago. And uh, uh, and I was also a coach for 14 years. For two of those, I was one of the national squad coaches. So <laughs> I it, think it, I can think of a couple just, of things. Just a little bit busy there, Derek. Oh. Um, you know, to, to decide to start diving at 37 and four years later win win the, the title, um, it, it, I don't know, just the, it, this word over, Not I don't like saying overachiever because not <laughs> – it, it, it implies that you're achieving too much and yet you're not. It's, it's just who you are. And, and, but I love that you've clearly got this driving you to achieve and master something. And oh, and the other, the other thing, I, I took up downhill skiing at 48. Right. And, I, I, <laughs> and by the time I'd been on snow for three weeks, I, I, I skied down a black run without falling over. <laughs> So for everyone listening, it doesn't matter what age you are, anything is possible. Is that right, Derek? That is absolutely it, yeah. We only have seven lives. <laughs> <laughs> Which one are you on? <laughs> Maybe the eighth. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're amazing. Um, wow. And, and, you know, the way you've described your garden, like I actually want to come to England. I want to come and visit you. And, and I'll visit send you the, some pictures. <laughs> oh, thank you. Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You probably don't want visitors coming. but um, No, no. We, we, that was the other thing. We, this is a social hub, this place. Oh, It, it okay. is magical. Oh, the other thing is uh, the cottage, the oldest part of it is 300, maybe 400 years old. Uh, it was originally, you know, uh, a mud-walled, thatched uh, country cottage. And uh, in the 19th century, it, it, the, somebody put a brick skin on it, raised the roof line, put a slate roof on. It was very primitive when we moved here. Uh, it, we weren't on mains electricity. We, we had a... a, a, a propane gas tank and uh, gas lights, uh, gas cooker, obviously, a, a gas fridge and a gas iron. Um, <laughs> and um, initially we were tenants. Eventually we bought the place. After we bought it, uh, we've expanded it to about twice the size in harmony. We did most of the building work ourselves. Obviously we got craftsmen in to do bricklaying and plastering and making mm. the window frames and uh, putting the roof timbers in but uh, everything we organized the whole thing and uh, did as much of it as we possibly could and nice. um, uh, and and so we've created that and and my wife uh tiled the 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 uh, we, we, we've got about a five meter square kitchen and my wife decided that she'd make the tiles for the floor and it's a 
a tessellation of hexagons and triangles with uh, all different leaves uh, imprinted into each of the big tiles. So, so we've got this place, and oh, and, and one of the other things I do is put on enormous firework displays. Oh, just it's something else. Yeah. Uh, so you've obviously got the land to do the fireworks displays. Well, yeah? we. Uh, I started off doing them here. We, the, the garden's just about big enough to do it. When when they got too big for that, our next door neighbours let us use their field. I can't really do it around here anymore because there's been a, a lot more density of really high-strung, expensive horses. Um, so I, I have to d- do that. But in order to in order to get hold of the the serious fireworks uh you, you have to be a professional so uh so essentially i made an arrangement with with a display company and uh, i ran a, another business as a, a subset of that and uh put on mostly small things for you know weddings and stuff like that but occasionally big public displays sometimes with live symphony orchestras <laughs> Fascinating. Oh my gosh. Feel free to just like drop in anything else that you do throughout the conversation if something else comes to mind, Derek, because I feel like you've not only, uh, you're not on your eighth life, you've got like, you know, a dozen lives in there. I, I feel boring. I feel very boring right now. Um, but I'm also inspired. Well, I, I'm sure you're not. <laughs> but that was, I, I went to school reunion and one of my school friends uh, said something along that line. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, it's it's wonderful hearing all of this. Honestly, it's just yeah, it's it's just so good. I want to I want to sort of come back to what you said in before about what you're doing now, and you've obviously got a passion for looking at the world as a whole. You've had decades of experience mastering different things in different fields, and so you've seen evolution and growth and innovation at its core and you've been part of innovation so you've actually been part of these kind of big changes in in our world in different areas where's the connection when when did you start being interested in the you know humanity and what's going on in the world well i I guess uh, i guess a pivotal moment was when i was 15 years old and we were all sitting in class uh, and we were studying uh, for what was in those days called O-levels, the school exams you take at 16, and then uh, you, you narrow down and take some at 18. And we're on this trajectory, do well, pass your exams, you you have a great life. And it was the, 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 the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And also the Vietnam War was just beginning, but that was kind of not on a lot of people's radar at the level it was at the moment. But the whole world was actually transfixed. And, well, we might have been because subsequently we found out how much closer we were to literally oblivion at that time. But, I mean, people were pretty... uh pretty panicked about it and we didn't know how it was going to work out even the people doing it even kennedy and khrushchev didn't know how it was going to work out much less all of the lunatics that they both had all around them and it was uh, i won't go into the details anybody who wants to look it up there's a lot of material now which uh, shows the, the way it came out but we were within a hair's breadth of uh, one of them uh, firing one nuclear missile. It was very close to one of the Russian submarines firing a nuclear torpedo, which nobody knew they even had them on board. And that would have set off a, a tit-for-tat exchange. And we realised that we might not have a future, you know, and there, there was a lot of agitation about it 
and uh, there were big demonstrations. There were people trying to get us to throttle back. But as it, as you know, rather than doing that, both sides doubled down and doubled down, created, even though they could actually destroy life on Earth already, they <laughs> proceeded to uh, provide the capacity to destroy it a hundred times or a thousand times over. And we have been very close to that happening by accident in all number of ways. Uh, I, 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 the way I look at it, if you wanted to find uh, support for the proposition that there's some kind of divine intervention or guidance in human affairs, the mere fact that we have survived for 60 or 70 years with that capacity without anything going wrong. And, of course, a lot of the, that period is just gone into background. People have forgotten about it, even though they're still there, the missiles are in the silos, the launch people are ready. And so the, I guess that was the trigger to setting me off on an investigation of, well, what is going to happen? What is the rest of our life going to be like? And and actually, for the most part, uh, it was pretty good for a few decades. Uh, for some of us, it, it, it's been more than acceptable for a few more decades, even though uh, from the end of the 1970s onwards, the trajectory for many people in society has been downwards rather than upwards. So that was, if you like, the pivotal point, the, the beginning of the inquiry. And I guess another pivotal point was reading The Limits to Growth. Uh, I don't know if you know of the book. It was, it was the report to the Club of Rome. It was uh, a summary of a dozen scenarios of how things might work on Earth according to the way that the principles, um, the, 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 what, the policies that we decided to adopt. And uh, one of the, one of those scenarios was what was uh, what is I think now called the reference run. The, it might have been called the standard model or something in the original uh, book, but it, it was based on a, a very sophisticated computer modeling system of the way that um, population, birth rates, death rates. Uh, food production, uh, industrial expansion, um, material goods production, uh, mining, uh, pollution levels, all of these things interact uh, because they're all part of one single unified com complex system. And it was obvious to, it, that that book was a bestseller. It was translated, I think, into 30 languages. Uh, there was a lot of debate about it. There was a lot of pushback against it by uh, people who were, frankly, to put it bluntly, bribed by those with a vested interest in carrying on the way we are to, to ridicule it. But what the reference run predicted was that if we carried on the way that we were doing uh all of these things would go into exponential overshoot uh, and then collapse at some point in the second quarter of the 21st century. And this is where we are right now. We, we, we're just getting to the end of the first quarter, obviously, and we're moving into the second quarter. And, and that was not a prediction. That was one of 12 scenarios, and it was there. It was put out as a counterfactual. It was put out so that we could change our policy to create a better future. But we didn't, and here we are. And I've been watching that. I've been interacting it. I, 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 I've spent my life, <laughs> as well as all the other things, um, that I, that I told you I've done. I've been giving myself an ongoing further education in a lot of topics. Um, 
a lot of them around this, also in the things that science has discovered and the philosophical implications, and if you like, the spiritual implications of those. For example, uh, I've been studying evolution very closely um, in, in, uh, in 2016. I went to uh, uh, I went to a three day symposium at the Royal Society on evolution, and there were scientists, 300 scientists from all over the world, with perspectives that go beyond the sort of dumbed down Richard Dawkins type. Um, simplistic idea that, uh, on a kind of monkeys on with typewriters basis, um, random changes can have got us where we're here. And, and, and the real story is so much more powerful and so much more inspiring. And it, the fact that people are informed in their background thinking by, by something which is nihilistic. It, it, it is one part of, if you like, the perspective of humanity as a whole. Uh, so, anyway, that, that was, and and th three or four years ago, I thought, well, I, I've been studying this. I've got all this information from all these different directions, um, and we're at a critical time. Uh, it's not doing any good if I have it, so I just <laughs> should start communicating it to other people. Wow. Um, it, gosh. How, how, how many others like you are there, Derek, people who have spent decades researching it, who are passionate about it, that you've come across? Uh well, it'd be difficult to put a number on it, but I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm aware of literally hundreds of groups who are, in one way or another, uh, addressing this problem in in one way or another. Um, and one of the things that I'm I've got on my to-do list is is to actually compile some sort of directory of those uh, as as part of the website. Um, amongst people I personally know, um, I, I I would say hundreds of people that I have personal contacts with in my life uh, have, if you like, this. I won't say optimistic, but this positive approach. Uh, definitely, definitely, definitely hundreds. You know, I mean, most of the people that I <laughs> that I speak to and maintain conversations with, maintain friendships with, I, I would say, you, you, you know, some of them are perhaps go feeling it's rather more of a long shot that we're going to come out of it okay. I mean, I'd say quite frankly, it could go either way, but um, if, if I were a betting person, I, I, I'd bet on that we will make it because I, <laughs> what would I say? Um, it, it seems ridiculous that, you know, not just from the beginning of human life but from the beginning of life on earth and not even just from that but the, from the um from the formation of the stars and the formation of the planets it seems to be leading up to this point where there is this psychic phenomenon of the universe being aware of itself which is what we are uh, I, I, and it seems to me absurd that this should be an experiment that fails by getting to this point and then wiping ourselves out. Mm. I, I, I like that. I like the sound of that. <laughs> I have a question. With all the people you know who are studying this and who have their their their, their own passionate interest in a particular area, are there varying? Are there great degrees of um, argument and? 
you know, contrary opinions? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, <clears throat> the, a, a lot of people are looking to some kind of political solution. They're going, well, capitalism is the problem. Well, certainly the particular form of capitalism that we have at the moment uh, is, is completely dysfunctional. There's no doubt about that, you, you know, and uh, how to get off that treadmill um, uh, or make a transition or create an alternative is something else. But uh, I've never been a great enthusiast for any kind of politics. And I think now I, I, I've realized why, because the, the two things that um, are most dysfunctional about capitalism is that it's based on extracting materials. It's, it's based on using the, the earth as a resource. Um, and all of the attempts at socialism have, have basically just been doing the same thing, but they've been trying to do it in a slightly different way. And the other thing about it, which is, I think, deeper and more fundamental, is that the, they, they rest on a sort of background assumption that uh, and this is quite explicit in the kind of Thatcherite um, view of, uh, of of society that that, that based on the the assumption that we are all separate individuals, that what we are all um, that what we're all out for is to get the best for number one, and um, devil take the hindmost. And that also is is something which stemmed from the misconceived view of the way that evolution works. You know, nature read in tooth and claw, you know, and survival of the fittest. And uh, certain slants on what survival of the fittest means, um, meaning the most dominant and the most ruthless, <laughs> whereas actually, if you look into evolution, um, with, with a broader scientific, rigorous perspective, <clears throat> you see that a lot of it is about um, is about cooperation and collaboration. How, you know what's fascinating, Derek, is everything that you've just been talking about. It like if someone was to just jump into this conversation and listen to the last five minutes of what you were saying. They would have thought you were talking about business. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're talking about humanity, but that see how you know it, it applies to all aspects of our life. And yeah, yeah. This, and I just want to draw that bridge for people who are listening to this, going, "How does this relate to business?" Well, hey, folks, this is exactly what we live in. You know what you're yeah. talking about. You know the survival of the fittest mentality. You know that competitiveness, that capitalism. That's the, to me, the backbone of this competitive nature that of business that I grew up into when I yeah. came into the business world. Yeah. Derek, yeah. talk to me about the the problem with that from a business context because you've been a business owner for like decades. You 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 do so much in the business space. Yeah. Um, in different respects, so you you have not just the experience but the expertise to talk about this as well to our audience and I'm really fascinated to hear it. Why? Right. Okay, well that's that that's very good because it, amongst I, I, I said I initially um when I left university I, I, I went into um computer software engineering with my philosophy degree. Uh, and uh, where I actually went I, I went and uh got that position in a firm of stockbrokers in the city of London, and uh, our team was developing the first um, real-time computer share price information system on a computer. 
Uh, and it was an incredible project. It was totally cutting edge. It, it was probably one of the three really, really interesting pushing the boundaries uh, computer development projects. The other two would have been air traffic control and um, uh, weather forecasting. And uh, had, had I known what uh, most computer work was like, had I had some experience other places, uh, I would have realized this was intellectually really fascinating and uh, and also that we were being really well looked after. Uh, but I, I, of course, I didn't know any of that. Anyway, <clears throat> at that time, uh, for totally crass reasons, uh, I wanted, I, I was like any other 21 year old Cambridge graduate. I wanted to be a success. I wanted uh, to uh, to be wealthy and to uh, gate crash my way into the upper echelons of society, and um, uh, and I negotiated out of that into um, the the business side of, of stockbroking. I, I I became an investment a- analyst, and so. I have an understanding of the way that the financial system operates, the way it operated then, and I've been able to be informed of the way that it's involved, evolved catastrophically since then. I mean, believe it or not, in England at least, I think it, stockbroking and banking were reasonably honourable professions. They were, prov- they were providing a useful service. They may have overpaid themselves. But anyway... Um, but I, the, 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 it was definitely rapacious, you know. I, 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 I was, I'd taken on that position because I had this fantasy that I was going to become a, um, a, a millionaire stock trader. Um, but I didn't have the personality for it. Um, and, uh, and I thought, I don't want to be doing this for the next 40 years. So I, I've seen that kind of absolute cutthroat end of it. Uh, and that is, of course, what has been driving everything else down the pyramid uh, for the for the last uh, 50 years, uh, bringing us to where we are now. When I went into businesses for myself, uh, it, it was against the background of a, of a, of a kind of adverse reaction to that kind of approach that kind of mentality and i wanted to create something where where i was being creative and i was serving people and i was collaborating with the people around me and i was being fair in my dealings and to be honest um Although I was pretty cynical about mainstream businesses, uh, and I have been ripped off fairly badly two or three times, for the most part, I found that, you know, in the in the small entrepreneur state, most people are honourable and they're collaborative and they're cooperative. And so I think there is a very positive model for business. And, and I I mean, that's been one of the hard things over the last three years when a lot of small businesses have been completely wiped out and their resources bought up for pennies on the dollar by the the corporations. And right at the beginning, I I mean, I won't go down that route too far, but right at the beginning, I could see that was what was happening. And uh, and I just wondered how, how how much of it was deliberate and how much of it was opportunistic. Um, so, I mean, I think there is a big model. I mean, the, you know, my, my educators, my mentors have, um, are very much in the mold of, um, provide a real service, provide real value and, um, maintain your integrity. And that works, you know. <laughs> it works on multiple levels. It enables you to sleep at night, for one thing. Um, 
did did that answer the question? Did we go off on? Uh, no, it, it's fine. You you absolutely did, and I and I want to ask then. So, given that you've seen this trajectory, this this evolution of business since that your time. By the way, you just dropped in another career that, that you had, which was uh, investment banking. Um, <laughs> since that time and you said that was the pointy end of the of the pyramid and, and you've seen business just being rolled out from that perspective ever since. You've obviously seen, like you said, the alternative, you know, the collaborative nature that people can be integral. How different is it today than, say, at the start of your career in business, you know, with that these two just sort of very differing models, you know, this polarity between what nature it really is and then what mankind and humans started with. Okay, well, <clears throat> getting back to uh, mankind and human, I, I, I think the thing that gave humanity the edge was collaboration and cooperation. But it was on the level of a tribe of 150 people is, is the usual estimate of, of what that would be. And our instincts are um, honed within that context. And, I mean, that this is a whole subject in itself. And what seems to be what has been happening really ever since the, society began to be organized on a s small scale is there's, there's this kind of mismatch between the instincts that we have to uh to take in information and process it and evaluate other people that were um that were evolved and honed when we were in small bands and we knew everybody in the band and we um we assessed them and that the ultimate uh the ultimate sanction if people were not co cooperative and collaborative and empathic was they would be ejected and they'd be on their own and they probably wouldn't survive uh, but the the reading of another person is something which has been very skillfully faked by people of a psychopathic tendency. And, and that is, you know, to be frank, the nature of people who get to the top in certain parts of these systems. And the instinct that we had to accept authority when you're in a band of a hundred and hundred and fifty people uh hunting wild boar or finding out which berries to eat was was the authority figures that you could trust because they had the wisdom and the experience and now, now that we have communications on a vast scale um through television and media and the internet and radio and film. Authority signals can be sent out despite the fact that those people don't actually have the wisdom to go with it. Um, does that answer the question or did it go somewhere? You, you, you gave a, a, a much more kind of broader view and you started to talk about, you know, I guess, yeah, that authority, how it's morphed, uh, it's distorted today because yeah. of the the, yeah. the channels by which that information is, is passed through. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the communication lines. How? What are the biggest challenges you see facing businesses today? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's <coughs> it's, it's it's certainly finding people that you can trust, and it's certainly um, I, I, I would say um, disentangling yourself as far as possible from 
uh, the, the tentacles of the global financial system. Um, and, and I mean, I'm going to leave that as a, as a kind of open question. You know, uh, it's not, um, I mean, obviously we have to use it. Uh, it, it, it's pretty difficult if we have to go back to handing over pound notes or, or, uh, or gold coins <laughs> to one another. I was um, going to say we we but, could park that for like podcast number two, hey? Um, it's certainly uh, it's certainly good to be informed about the uh, the manipulative way in which uh, I mean business is going back to what I said about banking and stockbroking being essentially honourable professions. I mean, they might have been overpaid, um, <laughs> uh, but they were essentially provided, not overpaid on the scale that those people are these days by an order of magnitude, but um, the uh, one thing when a stockbroker earned five times as much, not, not 500 or 5,000 times as much, um, they, they were essentially uh, providing a service to people who had savings to get a return on those savings at the same time as they connected those savings to people who had entrepreneurial um, ambitions and didn't have the capital resources to develop those uh develop that enterprise to mutual benefit because they developed it, the enterprise they they produced a return some of that return went back to the savers or the investors um and, and you know you can't knock it um, and attempts to do it by the government allocating um which resources go where whether it was on the kind of scale of uh, 1960s British socialism or, you know, Soviet Russian communism, uh, it was plainly a, a far less functional system than that. Uh, but at the same time, because the, of the insatiable nature of people for whom money and profit is the end in itself, is the main driver, uh, it has become completely distorted and completely rap rap rapacious. So I guess, I guess the important thing from a, a business person's point of view is being aware of that and looking to see what can be done in a collaborative way amongst the people who operate on their scale and on their, um, if you like, philosophy. So that would imply that the need for them to understand sort of themselves and, and be aware of their own values and, and hopefully be aware of what's going on around them. So they've yeah. got to take an interest in and the mechanisms by which they are participating in in our society and business and 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 government. Yeah, um, yeah, that's what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, what what capitalism more or less was functional? I would say between 1945 and 1975, it, it had its faults. But um, for instance, uh, the shareholders were not, for the most part, plutocrats like sort of. Um, Victorian bourgeoisie living in townhouses with ten servants. Shareholders were the the most part people like you and me, uh, putting money aside every every month into a pension fund, and the fund being managed such that it got a return and came back back to you. And whereas the way it's evolved now, it, it is that all of us. 
finding out pensions are worthless. They're going to be even more worthless for people who start collecting them uh, further down the line because it's been siphoned out along whatever profitability there's be, there was been, has been siphoned out. And, and the other thing I would say about that is that a healthy business is one which is providing goods or services for which there is a genuine need and a desire. And if you do that and you do it well and you do it competently, you will make a profit. And the profit is a byproduct of having done that. Whereas if you look at big corporate business, the the product or service is a secondary consideration to be chiseled out and and corner cutted in every direction towards the main objective, which is to make a profit. And and that just triggered off a thought I had again, which is totally relevant to business, which is uh how are we doing? Are we overrunning? <laughs> but um uh there's a book called The Secret of Selling Anything by Harry Brown, which, despite its cheesy title, is the opposite of what you might fear. It's, it's basically about selling with integrity. And the short answer of it is, is funnily enough, in the most successful period, when I, when I kind of ramped up from sort of fiddling about on a, a, a on a kind of almost hobbyist level with the electronics stuff and uh it was when i started to move into the retailing point of sale i I had by accident stumbled over this because i i found i wasn't going to be able to create electronics unless i found somebody to buy them and so i went out i started talking to people um I mean, there's a there's a very funny story about how the retailer initially approached me, um, and, and said, I, "I hear you're developing a point of sale system." It had just been an idea in my head, and I and I I'd written a letter uh, to try and hang on to my. Uh, I was a value added reseller for Apple Computer at the time, and they were trying to close my account down because I wasn't selling enough computers and and I wrote them a letter to get them off my back and I said I'm developing a retailing point of sale system and they, they said um uh and in fact it was just an idea in my head in a conversation I'd had with a few people uh and then somebody rang them up and uh they said oh there's this guy Derek Dearden who's developing this system so he rang me up so I thought well now I'd better do it <laughs> But I had to go to this meeting with him and all his, you know, board of directors and people. Uh, And and then as that aspect of the business went, this went on. And in my head, I thought, uh, I'm not a salesman, uh, but I have to actually talk to these people if I'm actually going to get any work to do. And what I did was essentially... Uh, I found out years later the the approach that is in Harry Brown's book, which is that you go in, you you talk to people, you find out what what it is that they they want or need, you figure out whether you could could deliver that, and whether you could deliver it at a at a price that would be worth it to them. And which leaves it worth it to you, and if so, you you explain that to them. And if you if you can't, you quickly um, make your apologies, uh, stop wasting their time, stop wasting your own time, and possibly even refer them to someone you know who might be better suited to help them. And with that approach, you realise that when there's a the usual view of selling, you know, in the sort of competitive 
um, paradigm it, 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 it is that the winner is the person who gets the sale. And um, that's that's a victory out over the uh, the punter who's who, who's agreed to <laughs> agreed to sign on the dotted line. But this is actually completely backwards. If you if you look at it from a service point of view, a, 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 in the broadest sense of the word, because. When there's been that transaction, if it's a fair and honest one, the the person who's who's bought has got the thing he wanted or needed, and the person who sold it to him has only got some tokens that are mm-hmm. of no intrinsic value whatsoever until he goes to someone else and exchanges them for something that he actually wants. <laughs> the mm-hmm. idea of Bill Gates. Um, <clears throat> Uh, accumulating a hundred and fourteen million dollars. I, I mean, I, I think I've worked it out that um, if, if he made a, a, a modest return on that, he would make six million pound, pounds a week uh, in passive income before he's done anything else, which, which is the lifetime income. Uh, I, I, I'll ha- anyway, basically, if you, if you want to handle on a million pounds or a million dollars, it's essentially a lifetime income of somebody who's earning twenty five thousand a year for forty years. <laughs> so every time yeah. you you think of it, somebody talks about a billion, you can go, well, that, that's a thousand lifetimes income from a typical right. person. Mm. Um, okay, so again, uh, that's all right. Was that the answer? Is there, is there a it, takeaway there? Yeah. So, so what I loved was your perspective on on the the I guess the greedy kind of you know greed focused way of doing business, which is basically make money, make a yep. profit first, and yep. then serve second, versus the other way, which you said came from this book that Harry wrote. Yeah, uh, which feels a lot more collaborative and based yeah. in nature, right? Yeah. As in, yeah. what does what do you need? Or oh, what do I have to to fulfill that need? Hey, I've got this. This is how I could do that. Does that work? And so you have you work out this synergistic exchange, and like you said, then then everyone's happy, and then tokens get exchanged that then have value elsewhere. Yeah. Um, what's really interesting is, well, it, and it doesn't surprise me, is I think that's part of the foundations of what we talk about in Six Star. Yeah. As yeah. in, it's it's not, a Six Star business is not one that is just focused on profit first or no. money first. It's exactly. the, It's the reverse of that model, of that competitive model, um, yeah. which we've come to learn, I believe, in our society that simply doesn't work. And you've yeah. witnessed it throughout your whole yeah. lifetime, the evolution yeah. of it. I'm, I'm, I'm a few years behind you, not that many, but you know, a few. And, you know, I can see that it hasn't worked. And that's what we are trying to create is more awareness around a, a better way of doing business whilst being the best versions of ourselves, yeah. not the monolithic, big m- monopolistic kind of companies that just seek to eke out every single cent of profit and reach their multi-billion dollar um, bank balances, you know, which is just really disgusting and quite sad uh, because it's not serving humanity. So um, we're on the same page, Derek, and I I, I love, I I feel validated. I feel like, I feel like, yes, we're we're on the right path here. and, And it's so great to meet people from across the other side of the world who uh, you know, you have these thought bubbles, but also these beliefs and these knowings, and it's just nice when they align. And yeah, yeah. there's a reason why you're here on this podcast and why we got introduced to each other. Yeah. And uh, so I think it's a perfect time for me to ask you the question, what does Six Star Business mean to you? Well, I, 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 I struggle to add anything to what you say. I mean, it, it, it's... um. It's like in the mu- music business, um, turn it up to 11. Um, 
know, because you have one to ten round the edge of the knob. <laughs> and so uh, obviously five star is usually the excellent rating on Amazon or Trustpilot or something like that. So um, when I had the name six star, it meant uh, go one better. It, that that's definitely the initial thoughts that a lot of people have, and uh, it, and yet your explanation of a new way of doing business is our explanation yeah. of what six star is really, because one yeah. better is is going beyond uh, the old paradigm. You know, you yeah, can yeah, reach that absolutely. fifth star. I mean, uh, star. It's, it's amazing that I came into that. Anybody think you primed me for that? <laughs> I uh, know. Line I know. <laughs> I promise you, I promise you, we didn't talk about this, Brian, in this conversation. Yeah. It, it, it's just gold. Um, yeah. Look at the time. It is, it is getting on. Uh, what um, What else do you want to share? What, what final well, I, I, things I, I, I would you like wanna, to share? I, I, I just want to share, uh, give a plug for my book, N- not just because I'd like to sell some, um, <laughs> because I... I, I I wrote it because I think the it's a, it's only seventy pages long, so you don't need to be a big reader. Um, I I could have um, could have written a, so most of the chapters in it. There's a chapter on population. There's a chapter on food. There's a chapter on energy. The chapter on manufacturing. Uh, any one of those could have been a book in itself. Uh, I've got the website. One world that works dot com and uh the one world bit of it fairly obviously the future will be when we realize that we are one world, not a hundred and sixty sovereign nations. A lot of the conversations going on about this, particularly in the United States are oh uh our constitution and our way of doing things and uh there's all this separate now it doesn't exist in reality it's a mental construct we have one world and and the other thing is we have one world one world's worth of minerals one world's worth of energy supplies streaming into the sun not two or three and the what works i mean it works for everyone and uh by that, I mean, as I said at the beginning, a world where as long as you have people who are in serious deprivation, there's going to be conflict between them and less deprived people. And the, then there's going to be paranoia and fear amongst the less deprived people, but the more deprived people are going to take it off them. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to get out of that until everybody has the essentials. Uh, you you know Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, and at the base level, you've got the need for your physiological needs, food, air, water, sanitation, shelter, clothing. And the next level of that, you've got the, le- the need for safety. Above that, you can start living. And we're not going to have a functional world until every single human being has that bottom level. And, and to that, I think we need access to education. And, and we have the capacity to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot there, Derek, and, and maybe there's, um, yeah, we can, we can have another conversation where we sort of delve more into this and, uh, we could talk more about certain topics definitely that would be really relevant for our listeners, I think. But for now, go to the one world that works.com. Yeah. And yeah. grab the book, the letter from 2100. Yeah. You can get the book on Amazon. Uh, there we in go. Fact, in fact, if you don't want to buy the book, uh, you can have a free copy. Uh, if you go to the website and sign up for, uh, for my newsletter, uh, I, I'll, I'll give you access to a PDF copy. Of course, if you like it, you, you could then express your appreciation by buying a copy. <laughs> of course, absolutely. <laughs> but um, uh, 
uh, and uh, the the website is a work in progress. I, I hope by the time this this broadcast goes public, I've knocked it into a bit better shape. But uh, I've got a bunch of um, I, I do a monthly um, online conversation, a bit like this, but with a, a few more people participating. Uh, and I'm still honing my skills in getting the balance between my presentation and and uh, the the discussion. But they've been pretty good. They're on video. I've got those on Rumble. I'm going to get a page on the website with uh, links to those. Uh, I'll, I'll edit some snippets out and get them on YouTube. And if you sign up, uh, I put out a an email. It's called the One World Minute. It's idea is that it's short enough you can read it in less than a minute because we're all pushed for time and uh, emails that don't get read <laughs> disappear pretty quickly, mm. uh, which with, with, it, with just a little n nugget. Uh, and I'm not, don't want, I, I want to keep our focus on what's possible for the future. The, there's enough people already telling you what's wrong at the moment. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I've got my ear to the ground. I, I'm keeping an eye on all these things and I'm looking at them from this perspective and I'll be sharing any insights that come up. And some of those might be helpful for, uh, not being blindsided by yeah. events that are happening around us. Great. Yeah. And I think for small business owners, it's, it, you know, we, we have a responsibility to, always be aware of what goes on because we're the ones that are actually serving our communities and the people around us. And yeah. there's a lot of power that we have as small business owners. So um, being aware and signing up for your newsletter is really a really great idea and I'm really grateful that you're here, Derek. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's great. I think it's come a full circle. I mean, when I was young, any um, energetic, ambitious grocer or fishmonger um, would expect or baker would expect to have their own shop by the time they're 40 and uh, have elevated themselves and if you look down the high street now you find they've all been eliminated um, mm. and the whole thing is is changed and yeah, and this is because the the bigger operations have the economies of scale. But it's quite interesting to me that those economies of scale have now been totally um, neutralised by the the bureaucracy that is necessary to do that that has to be carried, and by the profit extraction that has to be carried. So that all of these, if you, if you look at what's in a, a bottle of perfume or a bar of soap or a, 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 a packet of detergent or, or patent medicine, you, you realize that that actually is somewhere to 20 to 50 to 100 times the ingredients that went into it. So the scope for a lot of those things to be just taken back full circle to the small scale operations. First principles, basic clean ingredients and yeah. hey, voila, we've got great products and yeah, yeah and, a, and a local business. Love it. Do you have any final uh, tidbits or a piece of advice for people before we say goodbye? I can't think of it. I, I think um, don't let the bus grind you down. <laughs> if you're listening to the audio of this podcast, Derek's has got the best cheesy grin and he's chuckling away. And uh, for someone who's who's got that much experience, it's it's a great piece of advice. Don't ever let the bastards get you down. You're better than that, right? Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much, Evelyn. This great conversation. Oh, thank you, Derek. I, I so I'm so grateful and I've loved every second of it. Um, and I look forward to speaking with you again very soon.